<laughs> wow. It's always such a treat to see your faces, really. It's wonderful. So take the time to um, weave this beautiful day of being together, refuge in Sangha. <laughs> a lot of um a lot of us find the holiday time not as inward a time even if we try um, so I'm hoping that this, for those of you who feel like you need some quiet time, that more inward time to really um, let that happen right now. And also, I think some people have expressed to me recently that there's a sort of kind of unease or a little unsettledness um, ease and we don't have to get rid of that to find ease it's more like you just let your attention settle within your body and if that's um, too quick if it's too harsh you can let the attention settle around your body the space around your body So we're shifting to letting things be, being more in the experience of things without the overlay of concept. We call it dropping in. It's like dropping into the flow of experience just as it is. And as, as you connect with the space around your body or surface of your body, sometimes it's helpful to put your hand on your heart center, which I'm doing now if you don't know what I mean, but the, the chitta, the consciousness, mind, heart. If, if you do feel any disconnect or lack of ease, sometimes just receiving the connection of your hand or fingers touching yourself there. You receive, receive if there's any tenderness. It can be a very light, quiet, abiding, abiding. but it's like finding the chitta, finding the heart, finding yourself. And to remember the attention that can be at ease, it's helpful sometimes to just receive any sounds that are happening right now or the silence. Silence in regard to not much sound, it has a crackling texture. It has a texture. It can be the hum of a refrigerator, the sound of your breath, the wind. The 
space between sounds. And we can find some ease of well being by shifting to a non doing awareness where you're just receiving the textures and vibrations of the sounds just as they're happening. And you notice them change and disappear by themselves. Most importantly, by themselves. So we're connecting non-conceptually without controlling. And when any thoughts about the experience appear, we're not trying to control that. We connect with thinking, thinking has happened. We notice the texture or vibration of the thought rather than starting to think about the thought and think about that thought. It's just, ah, oh, thinking, no problem. Hearing. And then often it's helpful to let the attention settle into our hands for a while. A smaller area of experience. And the emphasis again is on that kind of well-being of just letting the attention settle in, receive whatever is appearing. Not the visual image, although the visual image might appear, which is a memory, a thought. You notice that seeing or thinking happens, no problem. You come back to the textures, vibrations, moment by moment, changing sensation. And sometimes this going inward includes the movement of the breath so close to your hands. You just shift over, or put your hands on your belly. And often we find more ease if we don't force or strain. Very low expectation, just try to be with the rising movement as it happens. The falling movement as it happens. We might notice a visual image or memory of how the breath was two minutes ago, or five years ago.
that's thinking. You might think it should be longer or deeper, or clearer, softer. It might be hard or tight. This is where you really learn. To let it be just as it is. Connecting with just life as it's appearing. The aliveness of the breath means it's always moving and changing. And if you start to tighten or force the attention, you just drop into the hands or go to sound. The thoughts and emotions of a human being are also alive and changing moment by moment. It takes so much courage to see that we can be happy, joyful, bored, angry, wistful, sad, enthusiastic, planning, remembering, judging, whatever it is, it's just like the breath or sounds. The awareness doesn't have to be tied, oppressed by what's appearing in the mind or heart. There is a great ease in just noticing fear or happiness come and go by itself. Not me, not I or mine. The word fear is just a memory. Happiness, just a memory. The direct experience is many physical sensations, thoughts coming and going by themselves. What I mean is that the words are a memory from the past about the experience. So seeing if you can have at times some interest in just what is, not how you think it should be. And if there's resistance to how things are, it's okay. Really no problem, just another experience that will come and go. It isn't ours. Sometimes it's helpful to just go to the hands, breath, or sound. And also let the resistance be. It will change out of accepting. That it's happening.
I'm just taking the time in the last minutes of the sitting to notice if there is anything you have been resisting or struggling with in your body, emotionally or physically, mentally, or in the world. But just whatever is easier for you to just bring some care, just pure care, connect with care or kindness. equanimity. Doesn't have to be super interested, just acknowledging it's there. No need to go deeply into it. It's not very light quiet, care, tenderness, or kindness. May we all be happy and peaceful of heart, strong and healthy of body. May we experience this ease of well being while facing the way of the world. Um, do you want me to share why we weren't here last week, Steve? <laughs> or do you want to? Me? Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Well, we were very, very sorry to miss you last week. And... Um, just up to the last minute, we were thinking we might be able to, but the Wi-Fi was off. Um, and the story goes back a bit, but probably a lot of you have heard that um, on the big island of Hawaii, the volcano went off recently, um, which for many people, that's very exciting. And you know, for all of us, it's very exciting and amazing 
you know, that land is being built, created as we're sitting here, it's still going. Um, Pele is the goddess of fire here, a very respected goddess. And uh, we all know that she's in charge of this process. Uh, and there's also, um, again, if you don't know of it, Vog, this sulfuric acid that um, emerges and it's called Vog. It looks like vo uh, fog, if you all know fog. Um, but where we live, you'll see the um, sulfuric acid start to come around the mountains and come up toward us. Uh, and if there's no wind, trade wind, it, it really comes in and it's very um, hard on the lungs or the headaches, lungs, sore throats. And it was very, very um, serious for a few days. So we all decided to go to the uh, land on the north side of the island where the Kohala Mountains block this vog as best as it can. If it's the best place you can be on this island um, when the vog is thick. So, um, you know, we were busy uh, the day before, the, the Sunday, and uh, we went, we finally got out to the land and it was very rainy, very windy because um, in the winter, that's often how it is. But we found a little spot we could be in, and we were we get we took the time to really clear out our lungs, and it really works. You know, you just get some space from that fog, and oh, it's such a relief. And we were all feeling so um, happy that we had the opportunity to do that. And then we started driving back, um, and once you turn the corner to go south, um, these amazing trade winds picked up like unbelievable and probably as we were driving it was probably 60 or 65 miles per hour and as we got you know we were really sure that these winds you know that much right would have completely gotten rid of the fog like not only were we happy that we got out and got cleared the lungs but we were sure like of course when we get home it's just going to be totally clear bad winds but totally clear and we, we started driving up in this thick red dust like from these high winds this thick it's desert area that I've never seen it like this and um, by the time we got home it was 78 miles per hour winds and the 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 red dust was incredible <laughs> we were kind of rushing to get some food because we knew the power would probably go off the power went off for 17 hours um, and uh, it was pretty amazing that just to to notice those places of of surely the power is going to come on in time for the Sunday sitting, right? And then it came on around noon or 1230, but the Wi-Fi didn't come on and no one could believe it who we talked to. And not everywhere near us, had everything had come on, but it didn't come on. So again, we're, we're sorry. But I thought it was just such a great um, teaching on, um, what are the conditions that allow for the mind or heart to open to what is, right? It's like, this is every moment of our life is like that. It, it's a resistance or acceptance, resistance or acceptance. And often it's that in the time of sort of one thing after another, or like going, oh, why me or not this or that that feeling of like kind of collapsing i can't take this and then there's some part of us that goes oh but it is what's happening right it's like what is that what are the conditions that allow us to move from resistance to acceptance to to really the genuine um, interest in the truth right versus the fighting it and that that was um uh, our teaching right now where we are is this um, amazing um, battle between the winds and the fog, the winds and the fog, and every day <laughs> you, you're not quite sure what you're hoping for, <laughs> you know? um, but usually you're voting for breathing, uh, 
but it is very interesting. Thank you for um, putting up with our weather conditions here. And thanks to Amanda for holding the space last oh, week. Oh, right. I forgot to say that. That was so wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Yeah. Lucky us. Uh, Steve, you're muted there. Let me. There we go. I was saying that those uh, radical conditions that Michelle just mentioned last week are a good illustration of what we call loka dhamma. Michelle mentioned way of the world, which is one way to describe loka dhamma. Loka here means, means world, but not the world that we project out there and around us. Rather, it's our immediate psychological world of, this, of the six senses, seeing, hearing, uh, sensing through the body, fragrances and flavors, mental states, it's a psychological world. And that's what's meant by loka, world or universe within, experientially. Uh, and dhamma in this sense, um, not meaning, not dhamma with a capital D, meaning the liberating truth or the set of teachings of the Buddha and the long lineage of nuns and monks and women and men throughout the ages. Rather, here it also has the meaning of, um, we could just say phenomena, body, mind, phenomena, including sights, sounds, sensations, fragrances, and flavors. Um, or we could just say nature. So look at Dhamma is, is worldly nature or a way of the world, um, often facing, when faced with those conditions, because I get a reaction, I get an allergic reaction uh, to wind. My mom had that too. We, we lived on the windward, uh, rather on the leeward side of Oahu, where I grew up. Um, uh, and when the winds would change, it would be onshore winds uh, often have an allergic reaction, get a headache or um, congestion, that kind of thing. So that's been happening here when the winds pick up. And you add to that mix, as Michelle was uh, sh sharing, dust, the red dirt, uh, and vog, which we're all allergic to uh, often when it's thick and heavy. And that's quite a worldly condition to deal with. Many of you know uh, from previous talks and teachings of the Buddha, that there are, there are eight worldly conditions that we, we face every day, that we actually face moment to moment all the time. And, and they come in pairs, like opposites. So pleasure and pain are two of the eight worldly conditions, loka dhamma, way of the world, praise and blame, um, deserved or undeserved. People get praise, um, but they may not be actually praise worthy at that time or we may get praise, uh, but if we're open and honest, you know, it's um, maybe undeserved or we're conditioned to feel that it's undeserved. Praise, 
blame, same, the same thing in its opposite form. People get blamed whether they deserve it or not. The Buddha was blamed and had many a uh, discussion with uh, uh, contemporary teachers of his time who would challenge him in his teachings and say he was teaching um, teachings of annihilation, um, which the Buddha would say, I don't teach annihilation of the self. I teach suffering and the end of suffering. That's what I teach. But nevertheless, he'd get, he'd get blamed even, even if it wasn't deserved. Or we might blame ourselves. We might have that habit, that conditioning of finding fault for ourselves, not deserving that fault. Or finding fault and judging others. So you, you, I'm sure you get the picture. Praise or blame happens quite often either out of a conditioned consciousness where it's this continual projection outwardly or inwardly, uh, where we're praising or blaming, uh, whether deserving or not. If we take the time and call up wisdom and discernment, uh, we may see clearly in that moment and recognize uh, praise when it's praiseworthy, when it's deserved, and, and blame if there's error, if behavior or conduct uh, is, is unskillful and so forth. And so then there's that, that wise discernment. It's not a aversive judgment, just a recognition that something's unskillful. And if it's ourselves, we try to correct that error. So pleasure and pain, those polarities, praise and blame, uh, there's little ways we find ourselves doing that all the time. Maybe even in this past sitting, we were doing that, you know, our sitting, oh, this is good. Oh, this isn't good. I wish I could do better. You know, Michelle advises us to lower our expectations, but do we? You know, how, how, how well do we follow that advice and just kind of let things be? Maybe for a while we do, and then the conditions kick in. The third pair, um, respect or regard uh, are the opposite disregard or dishonor. In the text, it's usually translated as fame uh, and shame. In a way, I, I, those terms aren't the most uh, skillful uh, encapsulation of the meaning behind it. But I, I, I like the term you find in the text of um, fame, and shame, because it, then they all rhyme. Pleasure, pain, praise, blame, fame, shame, and the last set is gain and loss. But to understand um, when we're, when someone is respecting, showing respect or showing regard, it, it's a nutriment, you know, it's good. We learn, have to, often have to learn to take that in. Um, it may be at first overstimulating or we may be unable to accept that because we have a low self regard. So when people extend that regard, extend that respect or honor us in some way, you know, how, how well are we able to take that in? You know, and likewise, when we extend that respect or regard to someone, uh, show appreciation, uh, are we able to communicate that? Uh, can we recognize that that person is taking it in or not taking it in? And what do we do to, to adjust if we feel that resistance? You know, how do we hold that person's resistance? You know, but still try to energetically communicate that, um, that regard, that honor, uh, and attune to their goodness ideally to the point where they, the person themselves feels that goodness. Or when it's coming 
toward us? Are, are we able uh, to feel that person is seeing our goodness even when we might not be able to? Does that help us shift and drop in to feeling and abiding in our own goodness? Pleasure, pain, we experience it moment to moment. Praise and blame in little ways, we experience it every day uh, inside of practice or inside of our, our lives, relations, interrelationships. Um, honor, dishonor. Uh, allowing ourselves to feel like true human beings, good human beings, uh, and embodying that respect that we might have for ourselves or others uh, share or show uh, or extend to us or that we extend to others. And in dishonor, trying to understand if we can correct our own error, you know, if, if it's true or not, if there's some way in which we can reset, realign and resolve to, to do better if someone um, feels that disrespect and likewise. Can we do that when, when we feel disrespect or disregard for someone? Do we fixate on that? Do we make it uh, uh, equivalent to something permanent, a permanent label for that person? Or can we hold it in a way in which um, there's the possibility of change if there's someone close to us, especially without trying to fix them or do anything to change. Just again, the attunement to their, to their goodness that they may connect with that uh, and then learn how to correct their own behavior. Uh, and then genuinely, again, feel respect for themselves and high regard for themselves. And then the last pair of gain and loss, there's ways every day, every moment that feels one or the other or both, that pendulum swing before, uh, in front of, or involved with um, our practice and the way we are relating to the life around us, the conditions around us these days, the things going on you know, on the planet. Uh, if we even skim headlines, there's just so much there that brings a sense of both gain and loss uh, every single day. Uh, headlines that are you know, evocative of pain and despair and difficulty, hardship, struggle, and so forth. And, you know, other headlines, just, just good discoveries in, in health or in medicine or in finding ways around challenges and difficulties, finding good opportunity. Uh, so the gain and loss we face every day, the honor and dishonor we face in little or big ways every day and praise and blame, pleasure and pain. Those are the eight worldly conditions. And as many of you know, we, we teach the equanimity practice, either the Brahma Vihara equanimity, uh, that is relational, that is it's in regard to uh, sentient beings and our possessions, our property, uh, bringing in an understanding of this equanimous core, rootedness, groundedness, bringing in that understanding is our navigator through Lokadama, how we navigate these eight worldly conditions of pleasure, pain, praise, blame, gain, loss, honor, dishonor. Because the equanimity is neither reactive nor by nature does it identify 
self-reference, uh, either of these polarities, not equanimity doesn't grasp to the pleasure and the praise and the gain and the honor, nor does it react and reject and suppress or, or cultivate ill will toward um, the pain and the blame and the dishonor and the loss. It's just, it's centered in the, in the midst of things with the understanding that, that all beings meet their, these lokadama experiences, extremes, by nature as the result of in past intentional willed thought, speech, and actions, those karmic forces. There has to be that intention there. The Buddha spoke of intention and karma being the same thing. Karma means action. And um, chetana, which arises in every moment of consciousness, is, is intention, volition the same as willed action, when we intentionally uh, use thought formations uh, in, in a way that, that is maybe underlying it is either greed or generosity, ill will or loving kindness, clarity or confusion. So we're in that way, that's how we are creating our moment to moment Loka Dhamma, our worldly conditions. If there's, if there's wisdom and equanimity uh, and other discerning qualities there, uh, we get better and better at navigating, at just accepting the pleasure when it's there without the grasping, the attachment, the greed, and the accepting the, the pain when that's there with the understanding that, that all sentient beings uh, meet the same experiences of pleasure and pain, difficulty and challenge, physically, emotionally, and, and through the senses, according to nature. We could say, according to our genetic lineage, it's passed down, or if you hold a Buddhist cosmology, uh, just according to how we lived this life or other lives, if we hold that possibility. So, because everything that we experience in the present is a result. All the pleasure and pain that we feel right now are results of the past. The praise, the blame we get are karmic results. We, we are the heirs of our intentions, our past intentional thoughts, speech, and actions. And all the honor and dishonor, the gain and the loss, all of that are are our results. They haven't. There is not yet, except possibly with awareness in this moment, a new generation of karma and result. At the same time, we're not stuck, we're not caught, we're, we're not under the uh, oppression of our past intentional actions. So we're not forever on this wheel of receiving continuous pleasure, pain, praise, blame, gain, loss, and so forth. Uh, what changes all of that, an exception to that, you know, all, all things that we experience, all things of loka, dhamma, way of the world, are, are conditional, conditioned phenomena, conditioned physical, mental phenomena. Um, As we learn this practice, this practice of uh, satipatthana, vipassana, this pre-verbal uh, awareness that sees things as they are, we're, we're cultivating also a new set of worldly conditions it's called the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is essentially our practice of mindfulness and clear comprehension. But the Buddha said it's the best of worldly conditions because it's the karma, the intentional act, actions 
that dispels karma. It's the karma that ends karma. So even if we, even if we live our lives in such a way that we put out and thus receive a good deal more pleasure than pain, a good deal more praise than blame, a good deal more honor than dishonor, and quite a bit more sense of gain, you know, and gratitude for that gain than loss. Even if we get on that wheel, uh, it, it, it's still, as the American monk Bhikkhu Bodhi described it, he said, chains are chains, whether gold or iron. So if an iron chain means we're, we go from difficulty to difficulty, from pain to more pain and blame to more blame and loss to more loss and so forth, even if we're able to shift that to more of a golden chain of pleasure and praise and gain and honor, it's still a chain, is it not? And the Buddha taught that just one moment of mindfulness uh, is a, a distillation, a distilling of the Eightfold Path into a moment of freedom. Because in a mindful moment, there is no attachment. There's just the equanimous abiding and the wisdom to see things as they are. So we're not cultivating new karmic results. It's a, it's a, mindfulness is a skillful state, but because there's no attachment and craving and clinging behind it, we're not creating a whole new wheel, a golden chain of, of, of goodness. We're creating the kind of, we're feeding the kind of goodness that is ultimately liberating from these cycles. So our, our emphasis on using equanimity practice, whether it's Vipassana, equanimity being in the midst of phenomena, all phenomena, uh, as it is, and seeing the as it is nature, the impermanent nature of things, the uncontrollability or non-self nature of things, that Vipassana equanimity or the Brahma Vihara equanimity that is attuned to our relational experience, other living senti uh, sentient beings and our possessions, our property uh, and relating skillfully with the understanding that the, our joys and sorrows are according to nature. Our gain and loss is according to nature. It's just loka dhamma. Uh, and, and to not be caught in that wheel of loka dhamma with either the ongoing pleasures or the oppressive uh, pains and, and difficulties is that, that centeredness, that presence in the moment where other, rather than creating new moments of aversion and new moments of attachment and new moments of confusion or bewilderment, we're, we're creating that freedom of non-doing, of unhooking from th that samsaric wheel of attachment and enmeshment, uh, enchantment with the world, confusing uh, the lokadama for uh, our, the totality of our experience rather than a deep sense as we all have, which is why we're all here, that profound, beautiful, skillful longing that there's more than life and death. That there's more than these, these, this polarity or fiction of opposite. There's more than pleasure, pain, praise, blame, gain, loss, honor, dishonor. And that's known how? By the power of being anchored by abiding in the present moment with this equanimous, mindful awareness, attuned to change, attuned to the selfless nature of experience. Or with the Brahma Viharas, abiding in the expansive qualities of 
boundless loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and the Brahma Vihara, equanimity, that removes a contracted sense of self by, by the nature of the very nature of that boundlessness, that sense of connectedness to everything. So we're not self-referencing. The universe isn't happening to an I, or me, or mine. Uh, that immeasurable sense of relatedness to all things uh, in our immediate surround, uh, in our interconnected field of friends and family, and on our planet, our solar system, virtually the universe itself. I, I, I wanted to read something by Barry Lopez, who passed away last week on Christmas Day. Someone that Michelle and I admired when he came out in the early 80s with his book, Arctic Dreams. He was a real embodiment of a, a true human being who cared for the preciousness of life and preciousness of the planet and, and worked and wrote and explored uh, with the intention of, of making our life and our environment better. So, but he first went to the Arctic. Um, well, I'll just read how he, how he describes it and how he describes how precious our life on earth is. He said, I made myself pay attention to places where I thought nothing was going on. And find then, after a while, the landscape materialized in a fuller way. Its expression was deeper and broader than I had first imagined at first glance. That's how he began to see the, the fullness, multitude, color, the shapes and forms and abundance of, of that Arctic landscape. And he built his life around it. Ironically, because uh, he lived in Oregon, uh, in, the, in the fires last year, the year before, he lost everything. He lost all his archives, all his awards for his work, for his books and everything. He was, he was a victim of the very thing he was trying uh, so hard to uh, raise our awareness and protect us all from the climate change. He said again, it's so difficult to be a human being. There are so many reasons to give up, to retreat into cynicism or despair. I hate to see that. And I want to do something that makes people feel safe and loved and capable. That's why we practice. And that's why we, we bring all we can, uh, equanimity as a navigation system through loka dhamma, the way of the world. It's not the only quality. We can bring courageous energy to bear in, in feeling the courage to abide in pleasure when pleasure is happening physically, emotionally, but without the clinging or to be able to make space for the pain when that's there as a result, because it's, it's, it's nature. All beings are subject to joys and sorrows according to nature, according to karma, and to be able to accept that and work with that and hold that. So if we bring energy, we, we, it can work alongside of equanimity and using the energy to restrain from the attachment, to relinquish our clinging habits to pleasure, and, and also to overcome the, the, the temptation, temptation to succumb to the oppression of pain. How can, how can pain serve us in this moment to awaken us, to teach us what it's like 
to be born, uh, to age, to have illness, to decay and be part of the death process. Equanimity, energy, patience is another quality. Patience is another skillful set, that uh, mindset that comes along with mindfulness without Patience, mindfulness would not be able to connect and sustain with experience. So patience, uh, another um, iteration of patience is acceptance. It is whatever is happening in this moment. It's a difference, as Michelle was saying, between resisting what's happening in this moment and accepting what's happening in this moment. So we can fully feel, sense, and know it, and learn from it, be liberated by our relationship to it. So patience is a very powerful quality. Uh, the Buddha said was uh, very similar, if not exactly like metta or loving kindness. So please consider these things. What what helps us navigate loka dhamma, in addition to the equanimity and uh, the energy that we bring, the patience that we bring to bear. Uh, and of course, the wisdom, uh, the wisdom that understands that we are meeting our results by nature, not because there's anything inherently wrong with us. We didn't do anything wrong. It's not our fault. This pain, this illness, this condition, this worldly pandemic, are, so it, they are results. And they are conditioned, there are conditions, they are part of the Loka Dhamma. Uh, I like uh, I like to think that as we enter this new decade, uh, that as practitioners, as meditators, as people who know, who understand the transformative <clears throat> and transcendent nature of Dhamma practice, that that we learn we learn individually and we learn particularly as an interrelated group, as a Sangha, as a family, how to help each other move through the, the Loka Dhamma, both in its blooming nature and in its nature uh, to feel often oppressive and difficult and really challenging. How can we, how can we learn from these fault lines There's a, there's a fault line called the Sagain fault line that runs from upper Burma in this area of the Sagain Hills down to the Andaman Islands. It's a subset of um, the tectonic plates, the Indian plate and the uh, Sumatra plate uh, that clashed 16 years ago, 17 years ago and created that huge tsunami. Uh, I think of the pandemic as a fault line, as a, as a split in the tectonic plates or a clash of the tectonic plates as uplifted so much uh, and created havoc, created panic, created anxiety and fear. The practice that we do is a, is a core source of helping, uh, helping all beings of this planet through this particular Loka Dhamma challenge. I'd like to end, I'd like to end there with my best wishes for a happy new decade a happy new era that it may be filled with 
more loving kindness and more caring, compassion, more empathetic joy. And the, that wide stabilized mind and heart of equanimity, uh, able to face the challenges that we're all facing and our sisters and brothers around the planet are facing. Thank you, Stephen, for the talk on Lokitama. We all need it. So, um, we really want to know how you're doing in this transition from 2020 to 2021 and through it with your own experience of Lokitama. So, do you have any questions? Just again, for folks who maybe aren't as familiar, that the, if you have a question to ask, um, that Steve and Michelle will take some time to answer them. You can raise your little, not your physical hand, but your Zoom blue hand. If you click on participants at the bottom, over on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, a little window should pop up at the bottom there. There's a little raise hand button. If you can't figure that out or see it, <clears throat> you can type uh, something into the chat and um, we'll make sure Steve and Michelle see that. Hi, Kathy, hold on a second. Hi. Happy New Year, everyone. Um, I, so I was actually talking about meditation with a friend um, earlier today. And um, one of the things that I said to her was, you know, I feel like every time that one of those like silences come up, um, very quickly, like my mind goes to, wow, everything's so quiet. And then like, it's not quiet anymore. <laughs> um, and of course it just happens, you know, like it just repeats and it repeats. Um, and then the other thing I'm noticing is that sometimes my noting of what happens becomes very loud. Um, like that's almost louder than the experience itself. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any comments around those experiences. Well, I can jump in on the second part um, first. <laughs> uh, I think um, Noting is like a learning to use a tool and it's not easy to learn how to use it well so that it often is blunt and um, the loudness of it, that's not the, um, it's not meant to be loud. It's meant to be a very light whisper in the mind and helpful to, it's meant to help us from being spaced out to connected to the moment, right? Being not connect, it's being, it's help, meant to help us go from disconnected to connected, disconnected to connected, so that mostly we're sort of asleep at the wheel. And, um, and then to be able to go, oh, hearing, right? It, it's like so huge. It's a huge part of practice is, is recognizing what's happening and noting is a tool that helps us no, oh, seeing's happening, right? Tasting's happening. We might eat a whole meal and not be aware of tasting, right? Or swallowing or all, obviously, you know all this, but I'm just saying that if it becomes so loud, 
it's preventing us from receiving the experience non-conceptually, the instruction is to drop it. And I remember the time when Sayadaw Ulakana said that during a retreat, you know, I, I was so happy that, that traditionally that that's not always said in, in terms of a whole group with the Sayadaw in Burma. The, and when he said that, I wanted to jump up and down and go, yay, you know, because it's so important for um, us to hear that when we're not using the tool well and it's, it's getting in the way, um, then you drop it and then you bring it back when you need it. So the art, I, and to me, the art of this, um, one time at the end of a young adult retreat, this young adult said, um, thank you for soft mental notes. And you, you hear, he didn't say mental notes. He said soft mental notes, soft, soft, soft. And if it isn't soft, drop it for a while. Um, that's, that's how I would answer that part. Yeah. Steve, did you want to answer the other part or? What is the other part? I the, forgot. Can, can you repeat it again, Kathy? Yeah, I think yeah. the other part was around like when silences come up um, and then there's there's not any mental activity in the mind and then I get excited about it. I think I'm a little bit less excited about it than I used to be because I used to be really excited or like even like scared I think I would say or like because it's just so foreign and then now I think I'm a little bit less scared but it's still like not quite so stable. I feel like it's just not stable. And then eventually like thoughts come on and then it's like, oh, and then it's gone. And yeah. Are you speaking I, of an inner silence, an inner stillness? Yeah, and also like in the mind, I think it, it, I'm more speaking about like the lack of thoughts specifically. Right. Because, yeah, yeah. So I think that inner stillness or silence can illuminate how hooked we are to the dis discursive mind as a distraction, as like a constant buzz or white noise background. And it provides a kind of security at the same time that it's distracting us. So as, as you learn, as a meditator, as you learn that there is this inner stillness that, as Michelle was saying in her instruction, is, is a preconceptual, that quietness, that pre-verbal ease and, and soft abiding, it's, it's threatening because the securities that we're used to, the habits that we're used to are are the noise, the busyness, the discursiveness. That's what I'm hearing from you. So it would be normal to feel a little unease or hesitancy or even fear when you experience such profound inner, that silent stream of awareness and, and abide in that, in that peace, in that ease. Yeah, you sound like you're doing really well, Kathy. You know, this is to be aware, as Steve says, of, of that fear is the whole thing. It's, it's to understand that, that um, the thing we're very, the thing that we want, we're also really afraid of. It's, it's so intense, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's interesting. I've never thought about it that way. I think that <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Hey, Molly. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> I've been talking to myself verbally a lot more than I ever have um, living alone and giving myself permission to taste the, <laughs> the, all the ramifications of that. But um, the last couple of weeks, it's getting to a kind of um, a, a, <laughs> it's, it, and I have to say it, it does demarcate some mental silence when I'm not, but this processing of language outside myself, it's so sort of outside the social norm of what's okay. I do it at home. I do it in the car. I'm starting to do it on the street a little. <laughs> and and I, I honestly feel more sane in some ways than I ever have. So I don't, I don't think I'm totally losing it, but um, I would love any um, dharmic feedback, <laughs> whether to, to just flow with it or how I might engage with, with bringing it back inside. I don't know. I might be a yeah, I'm so classically the type that talks to themselves and I don't really think there's anything weird about it. So I, you know, I just living alone, I did, I lived alone my last two years of high school, which was very unusual, wow. you know, all alone. Um, and um, I remember one time in typing class, my teacher, I remember his name, Mr. Delolio. Mr. Delolio was like, in front of everybody he's like Michelle do you know like you talk to yourself like the whole time you're like typing and I'm like yeah so you know so what like <laughs> what's the problem I didn't even know it was weird maybe to other people but I just kind of like I noticed today I noticed today I went for a walk and I was talking to myself and somebody drove by and I just don't feel like there's anything <laughs> weird about it but I am aware that some people might think there is and I think what I would encourage you to do is notice two things one is we're talking to ourselves whether we're verbalizing it or not like almost all of thought is talking to ourselves. it you know really uh, you don't have to believe me check it out most of thought is just trying to get our attention and when you talk to yourself out loud you're getting more attention you're actually giving yourself more attention so you might feel more connected because you're not ignoring you're not people don't hear their thoughts so they feel more disconnected from themselves so if you actually hear it you're actually more aware of your thinking and then you will the secondly um, I think that you can start to experience um, some some meta or compassion through that process that mm -hmm. you can start mm -hmm. hearing your own thoughts and then feel more meta and even feel more connected. That is exactly what I'm noticing is that mm -hmm. as the com self-compassion becomes um, a richer and more continuous practice, the talking to myself is coming on more. So that's there is great. Sort of this yeah, that's, that's a natural evolution of that process. So great. And the other part I would comment on was just that you mentioned you're also becoming more aware of quiet and silence also because of the sound. And, and I, I really feel that's also very important that you, you start noticing the quiet as well as the meta part of it. it. It sounds, it sounds really good to me. It, it can be hard living alone and lonely, but there's also aspects of it that enrich the practice. So you're making, you're making use of it. Thanks. Hi, Daniel. 
Hi. Um, I'm a little, I'm a little hesitant, but um, I'm sort of sitting with the thought that I will outlive Michelle and Stephen, <laughs> <laughs> which is. <laughs> You um, never know, Daniel. You know, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and there's a sense of like missing and also, um, I don't know, like, like the, the teaching and support that I've received from you and sort of fear for like, oh my goodness, what happens after? And it's like, no one's doing it for you anyway. And like, it's not dependent on someone outside like telling you, but there's still that like fear or something. So. I just wondered if you had any yeah. thoughts. Steve, do you want to <laughs> say anything? Or? Why are you hesitant to, to ask that? To say that <laughs> I think I was, I was I was worried about the other people on the call some people maybe because don't. he's acknowledging that we're going to kick the bucket right I know <laughs> <laughs> and that we look like we're closer to it than we used to which is true <laughs> I, I wish you a long life and that you prosper <laughs> um, Tell me more about how you experience fear. Like being left alone or not having the support or yeah, it's the, out of insecurity, out of aloneness. It's it's this the the idea of like support or like mm -hmm. guidance or things like that. Oh yeah. Like I I'll lose my way or. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might you might recall that we often say that in in practice meditation or retreat time practice. when the retreat is over or the session is over, the container and support and protection of the concentration can dissipate or does dissipate as, as long as we're not continuing the conditions that sustain that concentrated container. But, the, but, but wisdom doesn't dissipate. Intuitive understanding doesn't disappear. That even if it goes into a dormant seed form, it just needs the conditions like, like a seed in the ground does of the nurture of the soil, the moisture of rain and the warmth of sun. Uh, and those wisdom seeds sprout and bloom. If you can Take, if you can take refuge in trusting that aspect of Dhamma, that wisdom sustains, that wisdom continues. We don't lose those wisdom moments. They accumulate uh, in our system. And, and that's what likely we're most afraid of. We might be attached to the peace states and the solace of that samadhi container. But the real refuge is in the truth. The real refuge is in the insight understanding. That's, that's what you won't lose. That's what won't go away. So you can let Michelle and I pass away in peace. I think... Um... Often, I find that as Steve is saying, there's a kind of peace 
that can come with um, understanding that the physical body isn't a per it's not us like I'm not my physical form just like you're not your physical form that's such a basis for the teaching and so when somebody dies it there can be such you know the ultimate understanding or peace with that and I I think that sometimes it takes kind of going through that with a number of people close people that you see that I find that people sometimes are more accessible when they're dead strangely like uh, surprisingly that <laughs> like they're they're actually more kind of a, like around and accessible or through dreams um, so that I would be careful of feeling like oh it's totally over it um, one time when Maramana Maharshi that was a great teacher in India when he was about to die and his students were all around him and they were all lamenting him dying and and he started laughing and he said well where where could I possibly go like that's what he said right before he died like where where do you think I'm going like where could I possibly go and I I think that's an important question you know to, my teacher Deepama my first really like a root guru for me uh, the last time I saw her, and we both knew it was the last time we were going to see each other, um, she just held my hand and she said, I'll always be with you. And she died after that. But she said, I'll always be with you. So, you know, what is that? Like, will, you know, the, it's really important when you see like, well, who is a, per who, it, what is a person and who are we? And that wisdom that we've shared with you is always, it will be there, as Steve was saying. There's, and with, you know, with some beings, there's a vibe, you know, there's a vibe <laughs> that's accessible. Um, so just don't underestimate that you can be surprised by the appearance of, um, metta or wisdom or aspects that, we've shared that will not necessarily not be accessible as St I'm just reinforcing what Steve was saying you know but it doesn't mean when I go when I go to Burma and go to the place where the Myatang Sayadaw is the happy Sayadaw who is still this I don't know if Stephen or I or Jesse will get into a glass coffin and decompose over years slowly so I'm not sure we'll do that but it's a great teaching I'm kind of psyched to do it I love it but um, you go there and for me I just like sit sit there and I just miss him but also feel so happy that he's so free and the vibe is the vibe is so free it's so unencumbered and inspiring but it doesn't mean I don't miss um, that I don't wish that he's still there when I visit, right? Like, of course. Maybe time for one more, Linda. Uh, let's see. Uh, Can you hear me now? Great. Oh, thank you. Um, it's been a really long time. Um, I am living with a lot of pain, physical pain. And I don't think I can, I probably can't talk about this without breaking down. So, so be it. Um, I have uh, bone on bone in both of my shoulders and I've been waiting for surgery for months. And I am just, uh, so I go back and forth between despair and anger and distraction. That's my favorite. <laughs> and the other thing is I've not been really practicing much. It's been years. I, since I couldn't go to retreats anymore, I, I really couldn't maintain it. So I'm, since you guys have been online, I'm trying to do some but the pain is pretty overwhelming. And I just wonder what kind of feedback you could give me. And Michelle. 
the feedback is it's great to see you. We've missed you and um, thank you. I'm sorry that it's been so hard. We I mean I know it's been super hard and I, I just feel like what you're saying is so important. Being able to be angry about it, to to um, to cherish the distraction. Um, And you know what? What you need is some really big hugs, right? COVID time, but you know you need you see so much compassion and meta. Like I, I feel like you know, um, reading, being able to find you know any kind of pleasure, uh, uh, like with nature or laying down or you know just do whatever you can not to um, be in a fierce endurance test day in, day out, day in, day out, you know? Yes. Yeah. I mean, Steve had a stroke and is in a lot of pain a lot of the time. Yeah. And um, he also might have some um, offerings, but it's like, I think my experience of old age is that it's one humiliation <laughs> after another, you know, it's just like, you keep losing body parts and you know right. oh it's just like it's always full of uh you know another I turned 69 this year and got another birthday present that it's not it's not pleasant you know it's not a pleasant birthday <laughs> but I like to try to joke about it like you are you are finding that it's so bad it's funny but it, it's also not funny and um so uh, you know meta compassion good good books that are distracting, laying down, meta, 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 compassion, 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 pleasure. And then I'd like to ask Steve to also offer some of the stuff he's doing. Yeah. And yeah, I hope it happens soon. Yeah. Thank your you. surgery. Thank you. Thank you for your courage and sharing, Linda. When my, when my leg or my arm isn't numb, which is annoying and, and scary. <laughs> I know. To move about. Then it's either like a, a, a contraction, an intense contraction, like a seizure, a seizure, tightening up and tightening up, or like bee stings. Huh? Like these things. And so one thing that helps me is uh, what Michelle and Molly do. I talk to myself because like to get from here to the kitchen or the steps is an engineering feat. So I, I tell myself, okay, I'm about to get up <laughs> and I'm getting up and now I'm turning and, and now I, I'm going to move my leg so I, I I, my left foot doesn't kick the corner of the, the sharp corner of the coffee table. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm going to turn right. Uh, and then after a few steps, I'm going to, I have to lift my legs, both my legs. And even if my, if my left leg is really numb, oh. I, I have to tell myself, oh, slow down, slow down, no hurry. Stepping up one step, stepping up two steps, and then talk talk my way down the hall, <laughs> talk my way turning right, talk my uh -huh. way, turn on the light and just that accompanying meta companion that's sort of telling my body what it's doing so that it doesn't um, hurt more. Yeah. And, that, and that when it, uh, when there's some relief, I, I, you know, it's congratulatory. Oh, feeling good feeling good, mm -hmm. lying down, sitting down, mm -hmm. picking up tea, drinking tea. You know. it, mm -hmm. So it's like that companion meta voice Michelle was talking about with, with Molly. So I feel that there's a friend there. It, you know, if it, there's always a friend there. I'm not as alone as I often feel. I don't really feel like I'm being hard on myself, but I also don't think I have much of a compassion towards myself. Hmm. 
I mean, when um, Michelle mentioned it at the end of her, uh, um, of the meditation, I broke into tears. That's why I've been blocking myself out because I never know when I'm gonna break down. <laughs> but so how do I start developing that? Because I think it would help. Care, how do you, how do you develop care? You're yeah. asking, how do you develop yeah. care? Mm. <laughs> I mean, I can I can repeat my metaphrases, and I, you know, when Michelle was going over them earlier, it's I'm going like, neither one of those is going to happen to me soon. <laughs> Have you ever done the a metta or Brahma Vihara practice, where you 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 wash the compassionate awareness through your body, like starting from the top of your head and, and moving down through your head and down through all the parts of your body, maybe where it's really radiating heat and pain and so forth, you, you can kind of go around it. You, oh. you, don't have, you don't have to linger, just make space for it. You're aware of it. Oh. You just move around it like water moves around a river rock and then pick up again where, where you feel sensations and just move that compassionate awareness down through the body. You can do it silently. So what am I saying to myself? You don't have to say anything, or you can say, uh, I'm caring for my shoulder. You know, how I, how I developed uh, an aspect of how we, did how we teach the loving kindness practices, the Brahma Vihara practices, was from this hundred year old a uh, Sri Lankan monk, you know, who, who came to this center during the, uh, where we were teaching a three month retreat, Ananda Maitreya was his name. And, and the way he taught metta was out loud. He, he touched his head and he said, um, I love my head, I love the side of my head, I love my ears, I love my eyebrows, my eyelids, my nose and my cheeks and my chin. And, and so forth. He just moved and touched himself and everywhere. He said, I, I, I love this, and I love this part. And I love my hands, and I love my fingers, and I love my toes, you know, and just move around in that way, just making space where it feels too threatening or intimidating, you know, where it's painful, okay. like around your shoulders. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes with the words you choose to help carry that intention of compassion, but sometimes just in silence too, just like a cocoon, a protective cocoon. I think of, I'm going to begin by making it very explicit to myself. Good. <laughs> yeah, that's that's. Good. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, you're most welcome. Well, before we sign off, I'll put in the um, in the chat here just a reminder that for the next four weekends, we're going to be offering each weekend of a certain Brahma Vihara. So this next weekend will be Metta, um, mm. Karuna, Mudita, Upeka through the month. Uh, so for sort of weekend programs, um, there's still room to sign up as a weekend yogi as well if anyone wants mm. more support in those practices. Michelle, you're um, you're muted there. I think when we were thinking about what January might be like for people, we, we really thought like having the Brahma Viharas as an offering, and um, of course, every Sunday there'll be a a talk, including the weekend that that's open. So don't worry about that. But just to know that it is a a powerful thing if you can take the time to do. One or you know, like a weekend of metta, you might not think that's very much, but it's very powerful. Or a weekend of mudita or compassion, equanimity, um, if you have the time, um, you'd be surprised at how powerful it can be. But also, the Sunday sits will also be the metta 
uh, you know, the compassion, the mudita, the mm. equanimity. So, no worries. However, whatever you can do. Um, so, you know, we just hope this uh, week is, <laughs> you know, you can hold up through everything that's happening inwardly and outwardly. You know, we're, we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. So have a wonderful week as best you can with all the lokadama, the worldly conditions we're all facing. And please take the time to look at each other because I notice when people are, are asking questions now, they say, hi, everyone. And this is big. This is huge. You just remember that hi, everyone means you're saying hi to everybody. <laughs> and that's, I notice a big change in this mm -hmm. coming together every Sunday. It means a lot to us that we're doing this every Sunday. And, it, you know, I can feel like it's just really important, these Sunday sittings, more than we know. Have a great week. Thank you. Blessings, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>